Gabe, we've been talking about the command of Christ, do not lust. And we get that from the idea and the heart of what Jesus gives us in Matthew 5, verse 27, where he says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And just digging into this command, specifically talking about how adultery, more specifically lust, and that adultery is a byproduct of lust, that lust is really an issue of our heart. And in this episode, we specifically want to talk about how do we do this command? How do we practically apply what Jesus is sharing here in the Sermon on the Mount to our everyday life? And one of the things that I think just right off the top of my head that kind of is important, and we mentioned this in our last episode, Gabe, is that I think there's a common lie that is very easily believed, and I know I have believed this in the past, that if it's just a quick glance or, you know, or if it's just a quick thought in my mind, as long as nobody sees it or notices it, it doesn't affect anybody. And the the matter of, of really the fact is, is that it does. And we see this in basically the illustration that we have um, in in creation, but also I think in scripture of when a seed is planted. If you picture your thought as a seed, if you plant a seed in the ground, you don't expect the plant to grow that day, let alone fruit. But it will grow in its time and the fruit will come in its season and the fruit is many times much more in quantity than just obviously the one seed that was planted. And so what we look at, what our heart treasures will affect our our lives and the direction we take with our lives. And so I think that's an important element that we just don't want to brush over that it's like planting a seed and we will reap the fruit of what we plant. Yeah, Scripture says, be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatsoever man sows, that shall also reap. And how every thought we think is like a seed planted in our heart that will bring forth fruit in our life. And I think sometimes, you know, when Scripture says, be not deceived, it's because we do tend to be deceived in this area. And so it's warning us because the reality is, when you put a seed in the ground, it doesn't come up instantly. It takes mm-hmm. time. And just like you may, someone may think, well, it was just a little bit of less. It, it, it didn't, nothing happened. And it's like, well, something did happen. A seed was planted. Right. Right. And that seed's going to bring forth fruit. Mm-hmm. And so just to see the importance of um, replacing seeds of lust and sin with the seed of the word of God That's in our right. heart and how it'll transform our life. And I think the other important thing that we need to see right from the get-go as we look at how to do it is the reality is, how do we do the command, do not lust? We can't do it. We need Jesus to do in Amen. it. Oswald Chambers said, I may not get this word for word, but he said, only Jesus can fulfill the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, only Jesus can fulfill his commands in us and through That's us. Right. So when we talk about freedom from lust, we need to see that freedom is found in a person. That person's name is Jesus. And that he who the sun sets free is free indeed. And just how we have to cast ourselves in total, complete dependence on him mm-hmm. to do it in and through us. That our reliance and our trust is on him. Mm-hmm. And not on ourselves. Right. And as we look at this, um, we looked in our last episode about the pattern that is given to us in James chapter 1 of how lust, how it starts with lust, but then how lust becomes sin. And how sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And so the Lord wants us to set free from lust because lust leads to sin and sin leads to death. And so when the Lord sets us free from lust, he's actually setting us free from death. (laughs) Um, And so, hallelujah, right. And so... Um, we see this so clearly pictured in, in Scripture, even with um, David and in his sin with Bathsheba, that it started out with lust. You know, it says in um, 2 Samuel 11, 2, it talks about how, and I believe David was actually supposed to be off, you know, checking his borders and fighting his battles. Instead, he stayed home, is my understanding. And he was up on his roof, and he sees Bathsheba, and there's where the lust happened, where he saw her, mm-hmm. and um, and, and, and he lusted, right? Mm-hmm. And that's where it started. Mm-hmm. And then that lust ultimately led to sin, because then in Second Samuel 11, 4, it says, And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from uncleanliness, and she returned unto her house. So 
the lust conceived and became sin. And it's like if he cut it off right then and instead of looking, you know, had turned away, I, I, I believe that the outcome of this would have been totally different. But instead, he gave place to that lust is what, I, is what I believe happened. And that lust became sin. And sin, when it's finished, ultimately brings forth death. And you see, how did sin bring? Well, well first of all, he sinned with Bathsheba. But then he tries to hide it. And we see this pattern as oftentimes there'll be lust and then there's sin. And then try to cover the sin. Scripture says he who covers his sin will not prosper. You see David actually tried to cover um, his um, his sin, um, and that didn't work, and so finally he decides to kill Uriah, basically arrange, rather, for Uriah to be killed. He didn't personally kill Uriah him, but... Uriah was her husband. Her Uriah, husband. yes, thank you. Uriah yeah. was Bathsheba's husband, yeah. and basically what he tell what he has them do is is he was in the because um, Uriah was out fighting the right. battles, and basically he had um, um, his men ha- lead you have Uriah go right up to the wall, probably closer than what they should have, and be killed by the um, by the archers or the people on the wall, and basically he committed murder in in in, in so many mm-hmm. ways, mm-hmm. and to try to cut to try to I think cover his sin and all these different things, um, or to give place to his sin, and. Um, ultimately, though, his sin found him out. And you see how um, he, when he's being, it's interesting because when Nathan rebuked David, he says, how be it because by this deed, speaking of his adultery with Bathsheba, and then I think his, um, his murder of Uriah, it says, how be it because by this deed that was given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Wow. And isn't it so true? If we as believers give place to lust and sin, it gives occasion for the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme and to malign the name of the Lord. Because we have to see that the Lord, if we're in Christ, he's, like we damage the Lord's reputation mm-hmm. when we live in not in line with him and his word. And it says um, the child that also that is born of thee shall surely die. Mm-hmm. And so it's like lust became sin and mm-hmm. sin became death. And there were other consequences as well. Mm-hmm. And so I think we just have to see when, that this pattern that is so critical is that why is lust so serious is because lust becomes sin and sin becomes death. And so when we allow the Lord to deal with lust, we're actually allowing him to deal with the root behind or the, or the beginning stage before it becomes all these other things. That's that's a powerful story in how our actions do affect others. And specifically, Gabe, we want to talk about, okay, so so we understand that lust is wrong we understand that adultery is wrong um and we've also talked about a little bit about where our eyes and what we are and and where our what we treasure in our heart leads our lives to and really determines the outcome of our life but specifically i think what are some of the practical things can we do to guard our heart, right? talks about in Proverbs, I believe it is, to guard your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. And I think you touched on it earlier, and that is if you picture each thought as a seed, and if we're thinking lustful thoughts, then we're planning, then then we're going to have the fruit of that come later in our lives. And I think David gives a very clear solution in many ways to what do we do to guard our hearts. And it's found in Psalm 119. And I want to read the first couple of verses um, here as, as well as a few other verses. And David says, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. Gabe, I love that whole heart because it it's not divided. When we're lusting, we're divided. We have a divided attention. We have a divided focus, a divided heart. And it says that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. And then later on in verse 9, David says, Wherewithal shall a young man, or you can say woman, cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart Mm -hmm. that I might not sin against thee. And one of the elements I think is, is just can't be understated is that when we treasure, and this is a principle that you see throughout Scripture that just really blows my mind, is that 
I- instead of, I-, I know sometimes when we talk about these things, we may have the tendency of like, oh, I've, I can't look at that or I can't lust or I, I've got to do something to change myself. When in reality, if we just do that without any power that enables us, we just fall right back into the same sin. We fall right back into the same temptation. But what's amazing and I found as a reoccurring principle in scripture is when we treasure the word of God, it keeps us. When we keep the word of God, meaning when we treasure it in our heart and meditate upon it, it's like the Holy Spirit uses that and he becomes our protection. He becomes our guard. He is the one that keeps us from these lustful patterns, these lustful desires, um, because without his power, we can't. In other words, in God's way is a way of replacement. Like when you fill your mind with the word of God, it pushes everything yes. else out. So it's not like I need to just empty my mind of lustful thoughts. I actually need to fill my mind with the word of God and let everything else that's not supposed to be there be pushed out. Right. Scripture talks about the washing with water right. by the word, that when I saturate myself in the word, when I spend time filling my mind with the word, it, it cleanses out the other things. It cleanses out the junk. I love this, how it says, your word, Lord, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. How should a young man keep his way pure by taking heed thereto according to the word that like when we fill our mind and heart with the word of God, it this is it it, it pushes out everything else. And gave, this is really such gave a secret. A quick, a quick just picture of that that I just want to add real quick is, is you know, picture a 50-gallon um, drum or barrel and you have 50 gallons of pure drinking water in that and you take one teaspoon of cyanide and you drop it in well what happens to the water immediately becomes impure right and you can't drink it i mean it could kill you right um but what happens if you bring a hose over that and you turn it on even if it's just a slow drip and it and that that hose contains pure drinking water over time that impure water in the barrel, even though it's 50 gallons worth, is replaced with the pure water and it can be drink drinkable again. And that's kind of the picture I get. Mm-hmm. Yes, like, uh, like God's word replaces everything else. Like it's like a, as the fresh water of the word of God comes, it cleanses out the impurities. Yes. It washes our mind and heart. And what a wonderful secret this is to walking in, in freedom is filling our hearts and our minds with the word of God. But I think it's important that we don't get ahead of ourselves in this sense that if sometimes maybe the tendency is to say, well, if there's been sin or compromise in the past, well, now I know I'm just going to start, you know, I'm just going to start doing the right thing from right. now on. Right. But it's important to allow the Lord to deal with the past things as well, because if not, the enemy will try to stand on that ground given over to him and use it to um, to keep bringing it back up in That's our right. life, you know, and so I think one important thing to do is if there has been, if um, there has been lust and sin in the past, is the importance of recognizing those things and confessing them and bringing them into the light, um, not trying to hide it. Remember, Scripture says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, speaking of the Lord, so bringing things into the light because he is in the light and allowing the Lord to cleanse them and wash them away. It says in Proverbs twenty eight thirteen, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. David tried to cover his sin, Eve tried to cover his sin, and both of them it led not prospering. Right, but whoso confesses and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Scripture says in first John one nine, speaking of confessing the Lord, it says if we confess our sins, he, speaking of God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if there's been lust or sin in the past, the first thing we need to do is confess it to the Lord. But then we also need to confess it to those that have been hurt or damaged by it, or to those who's maybe who uh, maybe if, um, somebody was stepping out the author- under the from under the authority of their parents or other things and pursuing lustful or sinful things to take those things and confess them to those that we need to. James even says in um, James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And so to just realize the importance of confessing and forsaking sin in the past and then going forward, filling our mind and our heart with the word of God and walking in the freedom of Jesus going forward. Mm -hmm. We don't want to, we we, want to deal with those things. We don't want to put them in a closet. It's kind of like, what somebody said, you know, it's like we have a tendency of putting our skeletons in the closet. Well, some somehow, some way, those skeletons have a way of kicking that door open at the wrong time. And it's like, no, you deal with it. And the way that you deal with it is by co- 
as the beginning of, of the way that you deal it, with it is by recognizing and confessing it. And this is this is kind of a crazy story, but I remember this from when I was a kid that kind of illustrates this. I remember one time when I was just a kid, I went out into our old work shed and um, I had to get, we had like an old dresser in there that would store tools and stuff like that. Well, what I didn't realize is I think it had been probably sitting over the winter and there was this rat that had nested in one of the drawers. Oh my. And I had no <laughs> idea. And, and, and I go, and I don't normally get freaked out at these kind of things, <laughs> but I went to open the drawer and I didn't realize this rat had nested in the secrecy and the darkness of the drawer and I went and I opened the drawer and when I did this rat jumped out and it scared me so bad and and without even I just reacted and I slammed the drawer and the rat got stuck part way and it went I mean like you know whatever it did it didn't roar it may sound like it didn't roar but it made roar and I jumped so high, I literally went flying. The, the doors to the shed, my parent, my family was watching from the window, and they saw me just come flying out. I was like, wah! Um, anyways, it scared me. <laughs> um, but I just say that to say, you know, sometimes if we allow secret hidden sin in our life, it's kind of like the rat nesting in there. It is going to come out. Mm-hmm. And Scripture says that which is done in secret will be shouted from the housetops. And it is so much better to open up and to confess it instead of just getting caught and having it be found out and allowing those skeletons or those rats Mm -hmm. in the drawer to be found out it's like no opening the drawer Mm -hmm. exposing it to the light allowing the lord to cleanse it out so that we can be pure vessels fit for his use right and when we do that a second thing gabe that i think is important in dealing with with this issue of lust is we repent repent repentance in the way that we talked about in our earlier episodes Um, on this podcast of repentance being changing your mind. And the way that we do that is by, as we've been talking about, replacing those thoughts with the Word of God, with God's thoughts, and having that washing process. And then I think an additional element to dealing with the area of lust, and this coincides with what you shared, Gabe, about bringing it to the light, is Stay in fellowship with other believers. It's kind of like whoever you associate yourself with is who you will become. And when I am associating with other people that have a love and a zeal and a passion for God, that will affect me. And not only will it affect me, but it will also offer help, accountability, um, and encouragement to keep my relationship with God focused and I think that is so important for somebody to come alongside me and to say, Nate, how's your time with the Lord been? Amen. Are you, are, you, are you able to pray consistently? How's your reading been? What are you getting from God's word? And because if we deal with things at that level in the heart, so many other surface issues will get taken care of. That's right. And as we stay in fellowship with the Lord, right? As we as we stay in fellowship with other believers, then we stay in fellowship with the Lord. You know, someone said, speaking of the Bible, they said, sin will keep you from this book or this book will keep you from sin. Mm-hmm. And as we spend time staying close to the Lord in the Word and in prayer, you know, as we abide in the Lord and He you know, praise God that we, as we cultivate that intimacy and the closeness with the Lord through spending time in his word, he keeps us from sin. Mm -hmm. And in conclusion with this episode, one last kind of area I'd like to touch on is continue in prayer. Um, It's really hard, I have found, to go to the Lord when there's unconfessed sin in my life. When I know there's areas that have not been cleared up and dealt with. It's just like, I can't pray. I cannot pray. But keeping a daily time of prayer with the Lord, it's just like walking into the presence every time you pray, walking into the presence of God, and his light and his purity is there and his holiness is there. And it's just that much more of not only does it reveal if I have any hidden sin, but it's also, it encourages me to deal with the sin of of my past failures. And so I think these are some practical things, and we'll probably touch on some more in our upcoming episode uh, and our takeaway of kind of how this command applies to us and, and what is kind of the final takeaway point. But for our listeners, admit if you're struggling. Admit if you know you've been wrong. Bring it to the light. 
God is merciful. He is gracious. David did that in Psalm 51 in such a beautiful way. And I would encourage you to read that chapter. And then seek fellowship with God. Seek restoration of relationship because that is where the freedom is found. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. And we look forward to you guys joining us in the future. God bless you.